Welcome again. In, um, like I said, in this celebration of sound walking during Sound Walk September. It's not our only celebration today. Um, it's as well Babak's birthday. So we have a, ah, <laughs> a double <happy> birthday. <laughs> <laughs> we have a double feast today. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Babak and, uh, and Kelly, who, uh, uh, who will um, introduce her work, uh, specifically the work that she created uh, as a resident at the CFAT uh, Nocturne Summer Artist in Residence in Halifax, where she's uh, based. And uh, Inspired by her universe, so like as an interdisciplinary artist, she's um, um, creating a universe of connections uh, with humans and non-humans, and uh, in which audio and not only the audio in the human sense, but as well in the uh, resonating with the world as, an, um, as more than a uh, human language. Um, uh, world uh, is inviting us to take uh, part in. Uh, now, um, uh, her project uh, led to a work creating, created for the Mount St. Vincent University Art Gallery. It is called Decoding Nature, uh, Sense, Impressions and the Biophony. And um, about this, about uh, uh, human and non-human communication, um, um, and uh, connections with the environment, uh, we uh, will have the opportunity to talk with uh, Kelly and with each other. So Kelly, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for joining today and especially thank um, uh, the Walk, Listen, Create team for this opportunity to be able to speak about the work that I created, um, that I created during the pandemic. Um, also, uh, just a quick land acknowledgement. I am joining the group from Mi'kma'ki in Halifax, uh, which is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this is where I call my home and I work. And I have my studio here as well. Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll start by just saying um, uh, Geert uh, introduced me as an interdisciplinary artist and um, yeah, I would say yes and multidisciplinary as well um, because my work has spanned dance, um, visual and media arts and now I'm delving into audio and, and also creative nonfiction writing. So uh, I like to approach my artistic practice in a way that I don't um, have boundaries limiting what it is that I do and how I came to sound. I'm very new to sound, by the way. I only um, just started working with sound as a medium in the last two years. And um, how I came to sound was that I was applying for um, uh, an opportunity, a, an artist residency and as I was writing my project proposal, um, the project that came to me, I felt needed to be a sound piece, even though I had never done anything in sound before. So after I was accepted to this residency, very quickly I realized, oh no, <laughs> I better learn about sound um, and just delved into it. Uh, I had worked with a few people, I, I um, you know, did a lot of research myself and I just really started playing with this medium. And recently I was told, because of my lack of knowledge in sound, I was told the type of audio work I do is kind of gor gorilla. Um, recording because I just kind of get out there and get it done and then I figure out all the kinks and work with it as I as I need to or as my abilities allow me to. So um, I'm certainly not a professional in the field at all, but I love uh, I love exploring and learning this new medium. So um, I while I was doing this research, I had been introduced to um, somebody who studies bats, and they are called, I think, a chiropt 
anthropologist um, in Canada, and I had done a workshop where I could build a very small device using Arduino parts um, that would allow me to change the range, the pitch at which um, they're emitting their, um, their vocalizations and their echolocation so that it would bring it into an audible range for human ears to hear it. So we generally, as humans, lose the ability to hear in that range um, around puberty. There are still some people who are adults and even um, elderly that can hear in the range, but it's a very, uh, it's, it's not a range that uh, we, we can hear after puberty, generally speaking. Um, so I did this workshop, I made this really neat little device, plugged in my headphones, plugged in a, a, a very small little handheld Zoom audio recorder and went and stood in a field. And when I heard the first chirp of a bat, I was, I was brought back to this place of my, in my childhood where all of a sudden I could remember that sound. So a lot of my work does deal with memory, sense memory, and um, networks. Um, and immediately I had this fluttering in my stomach and all I wanted to do was like scream out like, oh my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> because I had forgotten how exciting it was to hear bats. And that started me on this project. So before I had the residency with CFAT uh, here in Halifax, I, uh, I just researched bats just on my own because I was so taken by, by um, the echolocation ability of bats and I learned as much as I possibly could. Um, and then the opportunity to do this residency came up last year during the pandemic. And um, the, one of the things that I realized which was as important as memory and remembering this sound was that um, these bats are actually endangered species in our part of the world. And um, Nova Scotia in 2011 was hit very hard with the white nose syndrome. And about 98% of those uh, little white or little brown myotis were wiped out from the white nose syndrome. So this then became something that was no longer just about having an affinity for this amazing elusive creature, it also became a sort of a, I guess, a campaign to save the bats or to make awareness how amazing these animals are. Um, and I spent the summer traveling around. The, the Nova Scotia government has on their website a bat tracker. Uh, so you can log on and you can report where you've seen bats because they are considered, they're protected, they're an endangered species in Canada. And so people will log on and sort of plug in their location and say that they've seen bats. So I followed the bats for a few months and then realized, you know, I'm really not finding anything here. And I reached out to Parks Canada and uh, the Canadian Wildlife uh, Federation as well in Prince Edward Island. And and they got on board with my project and they invited me to Prince Edward Island to use some of their scientific, scientific equipment. Um, and I toured around uh, Prince Edward Island and I found thousands and thousands and thousands of bats. Um, so I was lucky that I had that experience and that opportunity to collect so many bat sounds. Um, those sounds are, those sounds and a few other sounds are what went into the piece that I created. And the piece that I created is a, is intended to be a, an immersive piece. Uh, it was set up in a room with 10 speakers. There were eight speakers surround in a circle that were about um, head height or shoulder height. And then there were two speakers above um, that are called their directional speakers. So they were sort of bouncing off the ceiling, sounds off the ceiling. And um, when you would stand in the center of the, the room, you would hear the sounds of these bats sort of moving around you. 
um, and it would feel as though you were in an environment where they were moving around you. Um, so, um, along with that, I this this scientific equipment came with an analysis tool, which I used and played with, and it allows you to um, lengthen the calls or shorten them, speed them up, or slow them down, um, and change the pitch. So, with some of them, I uh, I had some fun kind of like playing around with this, the verberation and the length of the sounds um, to create more of an atmosphere, I suppose. And although I'm going to play the piece for you now, um, it's not going to sound like it did in the space, obviously, because it's only been saved as a stereo file and, um, and not as an immersive um, piece, which I'm still learning on how, how, how to save something that is intended for multi-channel um, so that people could listen to it as it might sound in, a, in the environment with headphones. Um, so we'll do the screen share thing now.
So, yeah, actually, um, when I, so I guess uh, that leads me to this, this walk that I created for Mount St. Vincent University Art Gallery. So after I, I finished creating this piece, um, this past summer, I was uh, in conversation with uh, with the gallery asking if I could do uh, some workshops. Um, and the workshops had to deal with this project, but in in a way to encourage people to um, look for and listen for um, for bats and uh, we also did some uh, we built bat houses as well. And then we did a deep listening exercise where um, everybody joined. Um, we gathered up at the art gallery on the campus and um, it was at dusk and I brought some audio uh, recording equipment so that people could listen. I brought my little bat detector and, uh, and we kind of had a nice walk around the campus knowing that the um, the bats are so scarce here in Atlantic Canada. I uh, I decided to create a walking piece so that even though they might not actually experience, you know, the bats in real time, they could experience bats um, through this walking piece. And it kind of grew from there because when I went for a walk about with one of, um, actually with Kelsey, who's on the call, uh, when we went on a walk about, uh, we saw several different animals while we were there on campus. And I started to think, well, what would it be like if I could take this environment that I'm in and augment it in an amplified sort of way and add more animals to this environment? And so, it then became a piece that this walking piece is like, it, it's sort of meta. I'm there in the environment listening to these sounds that are actually here, but I'm hearing them in my ears in a way that has been, you know, dropped in the landscape in a few different locations. Um, and that and that I've created on the Echoes app um, for participants to take part in whenever they want during this month of September. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of like participate in this particular uh, event here is because I know Echoes is tied to the event. I learned about Echoes last year through the event and, and, and then being able to create this, this piece in conjunction with Soundwalk September was really, uh, was really a nice thing for me to be able to do. Um, and I think that's really all I, I have right now. If anybody has questions, I, I'd like to just kind of have discussion about, about this stuff, thoughts, feelings. <laughs> uh, what is a bet day? I'm sorry, what was that? What is a bet detector? Uh, a bat detector is a, a device that brings the um, the sound, the echolocation sound that bats emit uh, into a frequency that we can hear it. Okay, so it uh, um, uh, upscales um, uh, the frequency range of the sounds that they make. That's right, that's right. And the scientific equipment that I used is different than the equipment that I, the piece of equipment that I made. The scientific equipment will kind of scan for a range of sounds and then once it hears it, it triggers a record mechanism. So you can actually keep it up. You know, you can, I, I, was, I was using chains and chaining it into a tree so that it would just kind of record for 24 hours. Whereas mine is, I have to stand there and kind of like hold it up and look for any kind of movement and hope to hear something. I understand that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Kelly, if I understand well, bats live in a complete dark environment and don't have any visual stimuli and uh, move themselves to an echolocation. Um, they do. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not, they're not, uh, they aren't, it's a misconception that they're blind. So they, their ears are much larger than their eyes, but they are not blind. Um, and they do move, um, so they, they use echolocation to uh, bounce the sound waves off of things within their environment, helping them uh, track food or stay clear from another, from a neighbor who might be flying near them or a tree or so on and so forth. And all of the sounds that were in that piece, um, there's 27 different vocalizations that I included in the piece. I have thousands and thousands of sounds because leaving that audio recorder out for 24 hours, you know, it was just constantly triggering these, you know, these recordings. Every time it would catch a sound, it would record it. Um, so I, I went through a lot of those sound files to select either the longest ones or ones that had different ranges in them and pitches in them. Um, and I included, I think it's 27 different vocalizations. And actually, I don't know how many different bats are in there because I know that Nova Scotia has, I think, six different species of bats. I'm not sure how many PEI has. I'm thinking they probably have about the same as us. As well, because you talk about 27 different localizations, does it mean that it's, it is uh, not only echolocation, but also communication? Um, yeah, they do communicate. Actually, bats, one of, the, one of the things that I really love about bats is that bats are, well, they're mammals, so they're like us. They only have one pup per year. If they have two, it's like twins, so when humans have twins, um, and they're very communi community oriented. And the one thing that they found, especially with white nose syndrome, is that when the mother, let's say the mother gave birth and the mother may have perished due to white nose syndrome, very quickly the community will come in and tend to the needs of the children, of the pups. Um, and they'll breastfeed the pups and tend to their needs until they're ready to um, leave the nest or the roost. Uh, another species that is that is communicating with echolocation are whales, uh, which are actually also mammals and which can actually yeah. communicate over thousands of miles uh, uh, and seem to have very complex, um, um, let's say, a complex language, you know, almost an, a singing language uh, that uh, that's existing out of many layers. Um, uh, and then your interest, of course, as well to interspecies communication. Is there a way that we as humans can communicate? It bets. Uh. And that's that. Actually, that's interesting that you bring that up, Geert, because when I was doing the echolocation project, I was also looking at other animals that echolocate. And when I compared the sounds, the sounds are very similar. They have a, a very similar sort of um, feel to them. Um, and bats do have a range of of. Uh, reasons for communicating. So it's not just to find food or to navigate their environment, it is also to communicate with one another. And sometimes it's friendly communication and sometimes it's not friendly communication. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there's warning calls and all kinds of other things involved in that as well. I've got sort of a question. It's I can't tell how to pray. But I'm reading um, Suzanne Summers finding the mother tree, and as a scientist, she had made sort of understandings about trees that were, were way beyond what anybody might preconceive. That this fungal network very sophisticated they communicate. Now, tree, as far as we know, trees don't make sounds, but bats do make sounds. Have you made any sort of seen any insights of, of, the, of a similar nature? Uh, to what um, uh, Suzanne Sa Sa Samard, scientific investigating in trees, that we had no conception of through listening to the sounds. Is, it, is this able to communicate anything? I don't know. As I say, it's a very difficult question to frame, but I don't know if you can get the sense of what I'm asking. Well, I, I do get a sense of what you're asking, and I would say that, yes, uh, trees do communicate absolutely. We know that they communicate with, with one another, and, and trees can, can send out signals, you know, uh, you know, hectares and hectares away to other trees if there's an invasive insect or something that's coming. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I know that. Um, 
And I believe that actually there probably, if, if we could vibrate on a level that the trees are on, we, we might be able to hear the sounds that trees make. And there is a very interesting artist actually in Winnipeg, I believe, who has used um, sensors on plants and she's created sound pieces based on the energy that comes from the plants. Um, it's very interesting work that she's doing. All right. Yeah. And now, uh, yeah, Bob, yeah, you're indeed um, the mentioned an important aspect of, of interspecies communication. It's more than inter, uh, let's say, animal communication, or in, uh, animal uh, um, the interaction uh, that is uh, um, becoming more and more part of, 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 of the latest research to bio bioacoustics, uh, but as well more and more plants are seen as intelligent creatures. Uh, the, as um, having an awareness and having communication in between each other, but as well uh, opening the possibility to, to communicate with us. Uh, it is said that we have uh, more than 50% of uh, organic uh, genetic material. Uh, so uh, we have, we are literally rooted in plants. And, um, uh, but it is specifically the, the species aspect in your work, Kelly, that, 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 that fascinates me. Uh, how, uh, you see it as a unity, you see not us divided as human beings from the rest of the world, but, but uh, as, an, as, a, as a connected um, entity uh, that by its nature is able to communicate, uh, to understand each other. And um, uh, as well seeing the intelligence um, of the humankind, not only as, the, as limited to the humans, but as well as, an, as, an, as, a, as part of the, of the nature, natural world. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but you, you mentioned as well that you have a fascination for, for uh, other types of animals, uh, like the, um, uh, the, 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 is there something that, 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 that triggers your attention for these animals specifically? Uh, I, I don't know why, um, it, you know, this is one of those things that I didn't set out to do this, it just happened. And I, I it happened because of a feeling, a memory that I had from hearing this, you know, it was evoked. And then, and then it sort of took on a life of its own. And now, um, there, another, another thing with Mount St. Vincent University, um, where it's located was um, a densely uh, wooded um, area that uh, for decades, you know, four to 5,000 crows have called their home. And there's a phenomenon that happens at dusk where all the birds will swoop in and, and all you can hear is like their wings flapping and, and you know, they're coming in and they're kind of chattering to one another. And then again, in the morning when they leave. And so that, that sort of was in the back of my mind as well when I asked to do these workshops because I'm, I, in the last year, they have cut down almost all of the, the forested area there. And so I'm thinking about, you know, like loss of habitat for these animals and what does that mean? And then, you know, like even what we're experiencing now through this pandemic, it, it has to do with ha humans encroaching on, on, you know, in these areas that were, were not meant for humans. And so these are things that we have to learn to um, live together we have to learn to respect each other and, and, and somehow find a, a way of um, maybe a, a symbiotic relationship where we benefit off of each other. Um, and so those were kind of some of the things that I was thinking about. Well, I've got another question. It's a similar sort of question. Is there anything as another mammal Bats can teach us about ourselves that up to now we haven't been aware of. So um, we've understood about trees and plants that they talk to each other. Well, we understand what talk means, but we don't under we can't hear them talking yet. But we can understand that dimension about plants that we had no conception of. Is there something about bats that, uh, and that's obviously taught us more about ourselves rather than taught um, 
pleased about themselves because they already know these things. I don't, maybe advanced communication will be able to initiate that conversation. But is there essentially just simply is there anything about bats uh, throughout Actually, the perception of themselves that we can learn about ourselves from that? Yeah, that's a very good question, I think, right now, especially um, because of the white nose syndrome. And I don't have a whole lot of information on this, but I, I, I did have this discussion with um, with the fellow in PEI who is the specialist. He's the, the white nose syndrome specialist working in for the Wildlife Canadian Wildlife Federation. And we were talking about how um, so there are they are becoming there's about 4% of the population of bats are surviving uh, and and also being able to procreate after surviving um, the white nose syndrome. So they're starting to develop an antibody or, or some some type of immunity. And so they're they're tracking this now because they've managed to somehow survive although it's in small numbers, um, something that is devastating to them. And so they're hoping to learn learn from them uh, what it is that they have, that they have been able to um, uh, persevere from this white nose syndrome. Also longevity, bats, you know, the oldest bat I believe is about 40 years old or something like that. So they have quite a bit of longevity as well. So we have a, we do have a lot to learn scientifically from bats. Thank you. Uh, hi, Kelly. Thanks for uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just curious, and you might have mentioned this, and uh, my apologies if I missed it. Did you place the device? On the like at the location and just leave it there and record, or were you um, like on the premises when you were recording? So thanks, hi Rob, and thanks for the question. Um, I uh, I had three um, passive pieces of scientific equipment that I placed in three different locations, and then I had my active piece. So. It was a combination of my own standing around and being attacked by bugs because holy moly, I was in marshes and all kinds of places. So I was like getting <laughs> attacked by mosquitoes. Um, so yeah, there, there was audio recordings that I had recorded on my small device. And then there was three other scientific um, pieces of equipment that I used. Okay, and so just to follow up on that, um, and I'm, I'm sure it's like, impossible for you to perceive but did you did you notice any differences in the recordings when you were present and like when you weren't um well if you're if you're wondering about the activity while i was present in terms of um their presence with knowing that i'm there versus me not being there i i i can't really say um, but what I can say is that the quality of the recorded um, sounds that came from the scientific equipment is a little bit more static and flat, more mechanical, and the pieces that came from my uh, audio recording device, because I was using a, a, a certain setting and maybe a higher quality microphone, those, those recordings seem to be richer and deeper. Thank you. Uh, another thing that strikes me, Kelly, is that actually you were not only like uh, recording sounds, but, but recording movements, because echolocation is uh, technically um, yeah, it's technically based on on, on movement. Uh, there's a lot of creating uh, possibilities for movement in, into a space. And, um, and let's say the, the, the parallel uh, dimension with walking and that you eventually created a walk, inviting people to as well move. Uh, and, um, um, but as well, the fact that you find in the natural world, you find the, the bugs like as you talk about, which have essentially as well uh, languages based on movement and, uh, um, and on patterns and for which, for who uh, the, um, uh, 
uh, were resonating, or, or like the, the, the sounds they pre produced, uh, not directly echolocating, but, but, but uh, are all based on, on, on like uh, going between movement and sound all the time. And oh, wow. did you make a sort of um, uh, relation between that, the walk that you eventually created and the idea of movement uh, that um, uh, bats are uh, creating by sound? Sorry, can you ask that just one more time? If, if the walk uh, that you created uh, has a sort of, the, the, is, is related to the movement of the bats, that you, uh, if you had put this idea of echolocating the patterns of movement, um, if, um, uh, if that, is, that became a sort of part of the experience of, of, of the walk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, so when I, when I created the walk on uh, Echoes, I used the map that's available on Echoes there uh, while, you're, while you're creating the walk. All of the sounds were sounds that I had recorded while I was also recording bats. So I spent the summer last year camping all over Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. And so I was recording sounds of uh, coyotes and beavers and, you know, like anything that I was making a sound. I, if I could get my audio recording device out fast enough, I would record the sounds. Um, and those are the sounds that I decided to sort of pop into these, the map. And, and the way I created it was that while I walked through um, the space, I would think in my mind, okay, I can envision, you know, um, a deer here or the coyotes calling here. Where, would, where were the crows before they were uprooted? So the crows ended up in a place that they would normally have been before the trees were gone. Um, the bats, I... I kind of had to fabricate where the bats would be. And so I, I tried to drop them into a map where it might make sense for them to be. But then at the same time, I also put a couple outliers in there as well that maybe aren't, they are, they would have been indigenous animals to this area, but they're not here anymore because we've kind of moved them out. Um, so yeah, anyway, I had fun with it. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoy using um, the Echoes app and uh, it's kind of addictive, I think. <laughs> So uh, it's great for creativity. I have a question, Kelly, if you can hear me. Sure. Uh, Hi. Thanks for sharing your work. Hi. Uh, you had mentioned the workshop with Mount St. Vincent and actually building bat homes as well. Um, I was just, I'm just curious if there was any success um, in in housing bats through that process and if you see that, like to me that sounds like a form of reciprocity or ethics to your practice as like giving back to the bats in some way. And um, yeah, if you have sort of, if that's part of your ethical framework, I'm curious to know. And um, now that we can listen to bats through your work and care about them in a different way, I guess, what's the next, it seems sort of like a call to action, like what, what can we do now to help the bats? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for, for asking that. Um, what you can do now is just if you're interested to, to learn as much as you can about bats. And so um, I know that there's a very, very small uh, resurgence in the bat population. I think I said it was something like 4%. Um, and if you spot bats anywhere that you contact the, um, or you know, log into the website, I know that every province is doing this um, and all provinces have a, um, they all have on their government websites, you know, um, bat house building um, little models and uh, you can print off the uh, instructions for that. There's a lot of information available on the government websites because they are now an endangered species across Canada and they are protected. Um, one thing that we have to watch here in Canada is, is the spread of misinformation. So the more you can arm yourself with positive facts about bats um, and then spread that information, the better off they'll be. Uh, I know that there's a lot of fear, especially in the rural areas of, of our province. Um, sadly, last year there was a shooting 
in an abandoned barn where they people knew that was a roost and it was being protected and hidden. Um, uh, they, the scientists were not sharing the information on its location, but the locals um, found it and they shot up the, uh, the barn and scared and killed many bats. So this is the kind of stuff that we're dealing with is, is um, the fear of bats needs to, people need to be aware that they are not something to be feared. And uh, one of the number one um, misconceptions about bats is that they are, um, uh, they all carry rabies. Um, they do carry rabies, but all wild animals have the chance of carrying rabies. And there's more um, chance of encountering a, a an animal like a fox or a, a raccoon with rabies than, than a bat with rabies. Um, so yes, a wild animals are all wild animals and you need to take care when you're around them, um, but uh, not to fear uh, the bat just because of that. So yeah, and as far as my, um, my practice, um, I like that you recognized that um, it's it's a giving back. Um, I don't think I set out intentionally. Uh, like I said, it sort of happened organically, and all of a sudden I have this now. I have this like pull to do right by bats, um, and they are an incredible resource for um, for agriculture. And um, and even for keeping the ecosystem, even you know, evening out the insects within the ecosystem. So they're really important to have. Um, yeah, I, that's all I can say. There's there's this great. I'll just share this quickly with you. But there's this great place in Austin, Texas, called the Bat Bridge. And if you Google it after this, uh, you can have a look and see on YouTube. They have some videos um, in in Texas in the late '80s. There was a bridge that needed to be reconstructed or fixed and so they had put these kind of girders in underneath and it was the perfect place for bats to go and, and roost and um, thousands and thousands and thousands of bats made their home in this bridge which scared the people and the people wanted to eradicate the bats and um, a scientist actually moved there to start educating the people on the benefits of bats and it's now become a mainstay and they've reconstructed many of their bridges in the area just so that they will house the bats and people travel from all over the world to go and see these bats. Um, that's a dream of mine so hopefully when COVID is over and done with I'll be able to go but people go from everywhere um, because the only other place you can see bats like that would be in I believe in Africa. That many bats. That's so cool. We have architecture here to, you know, prevent pigeons from roosting in areas and even, you know, people from occupying certain spaces. So thinking about that architecture as a way of building homes for them in the city is really cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for sharing all this and um, I just, I kind of have a, like a comment and a question about the piece. So um, I love the part where it brings you back to something in your childhood, um, a little bit like that Madeleine from Marcel Proust, like where, you know, he takes a bite and he, he goes back to the moment where he tasted that as a child. And so I went into the piece kind of thinking about that and it did like it brought me back to my childhood but I would never have guessed that those were bats so I kind of almost imagined myself like sitting in the middle of the forest and that's what I would hear and then at the beginning I thought maybe that's what fairies like sounded like and I just didn't know <laughs> but it was like a remembering it felt so soothing I like I wanted to fall asleep not because I was tired but just because I was relaxing like and then my question is that so it felt like they were they were they were opposite absolutely communicating but it felt like in like you could know what they were saying but you couldn't really know with your intellect but you could know with your heart or maybe you could know maybe as a child you probably didn't know so I'm kind of curious about this more of a 
subjective and aesthetic question <laughs> more than a scientific question is um, what does that piece say to you? What what is communicated in your, you know? <laughs> well, what I want to say immediately without thinking about it with my intellect is that uh, it's it's like let's share the space. And I remember, you know, as I was standing there holding my my uh, my little device, I I could see them. But actually, I didn't see them until I heard the first chirp. And so as soon as I heard the first chirp, then I could see them. And they were so gleefully, you know, kind of flying around me. And they were aware of my presence, I'm sure. And it, it, it almost felt like there was they were like showing off for me so that I could actually enjoy the moment and, and take it all in. So, so I felt as though this was like we're sharing the space, we're sharing this. This is this is the right thing, you know. It wasn't dangerous. It wasn't dangerous for us. It wasn't dangerous for them. And it just it just felt very positive. Um, and and about the the sort of lulling you or making you feel as though you were like in a quiet or meditative space. Um, it was really beautiful during the exhibition because I had all the lights off and I only had the sound, sound uh, you know, in the speaker so people would enter and go into the center. Um, and then there was two red lights. One, one was an exit light on one side and then the other side I just had a red, kind of a small red glowing light. So, so the room was sort of this dark red, sort of illuminated with a little bit of red in it. And um, every once in a while, I would go in and just, you know, check out the space. And, and a lot of times, people were laying on the floor in the middle. And they yeah. were just looking in with their, you know, hands on their chest and just sort of like eyes closed looking up at the ceiling, um, just allowing the sounds to kind of like go through them. And that's what I experienced when I was a child, was just laying there and listening and allowing the sounds to like enter me, you know? Yes. Yeah, it felt like I was receiving quite a bit. Yeah. They were very generous, and I, yeah, so, yeah, I would love to just lay by myself and put my earplugs in and see what happens and have it closer. Thank you. Well, I'm working with a, an engineer right now to learn how to take a, you know, a multi-channel piece and turn it into an immersive for headphones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, gaming headphones... You can have like right, right, left, front, and right, left, back, so that it actually feels like things are moving around you in the same way that those speakers would work. So, hopefully, I'll be able to engineer that so that it can go into headphones. Amazing. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Hi, Kelly. It's Nancy. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your your question, Anne. I had something similar, so it got answered. And yet I just wanted to acknowledge one of the things that I experienced through it, the quote that came to me, and I don't have the quote correctly, but it's like, nature wants us to see it. It's like this reciprocity of relationship. And I think your curiosity in your work and how you approach it um really invites for me it invited me to come along that journey with you even though we just had a really particular clip and um for me i feel like i have a deeper intimacy with nature just from your experience of providing your work and the attention to detail and i know nothing about echolocation but i'm you know, I, I feel like it's fed something that I'm different from this and I'll be more curious and I will think more of the bats and the other sounds that are in my location as a result of this experience. So my deepest oh. gratitude to yeah, you. I want you. more. <laughs> thank you. Um, but I can't let this um, time pass without um, explaining something that has come to me from this process and also by being part of Soundwalk September. 
Um, uh, so last year, I sat in on, on many of these types of talks, and I was exposed to somebody speaking about something that was called uh, deep listening. And very quickly, it piqued my interest. And so I started to look into this concept of deep listening. And I think that this, the concept of deep listening is really what is needed or necessary for me to make the kind of work that I make. And, um, and so uh, the woman who developed this, this concept of deep listening, her name is Paula Oliveros. And she was an American um, experimental musician and composer. And um, she talks about, actually, I have a little something that I took from her, her website. She, she refers to deep listening as including all sounds, expanding, expanding the boundaries of perception. It explores the relationships among any and all sounds, whether natural or technological, intended or unintended, real, remembered, or imaginary, and that includes thought. So when I was thinking about, you know, the work that I do, a lot of times when I'm going to collect sounds in nature, oftentimes I have to ground myself before I do. So I'll do some deep breathing and kind of close my eyes to be in the environment and to really like shut out. Like that's, that's the part that's intentional. I have to shut out the other stuff. And when we did the walk at Mount St. Vincent University um, in the summertime, there was trains and traffic happening and I said to everybody in the circle like we have to just kind of like intentionally shut that part off so that we can um, hear the sounds, listen for the sounds that that are much more subtle. And so I, I, I tend to find myself before making a recording even if it's at the ocean and sometimes the ocean is just like really imposing and loud but there's other sounds underneath, like when when the ocean retracts and the little bits of water are just kind of falling through underneath the rocks, the gurgling noises that happen. Um, maybe I wouldn't hear that if all I was listening for was the, the rushing sounds of the waves. So, um, so I think this deep lip listening co uh, concept is really important to my work. And I'm so happy that I was exposed to it last year because although I think I was doing it anyway intuitively, um, I actually was able to understand it more by learning about concept. Are there any other questions or comments or anything? Now, what I remember, Kelly, about Pauline Oliveros, that she once said, um, uh, listen as uh, your uh, ears are feet, um, uh, meaning yes. by <laughs> meaning by that that you first of all you don't just listen with your ears, uh, that you listen with your whole body, and as well uh, listening is has to do with, with with movement, with being in a place, being in the place, and then moving to this place. So it's never isolated. It's not just about the sounds. It's about everything that is around you. So listening is always echolocating because you are um, in relation to the, always in relation to the place where you are. Uh, you're always in the space, and then you always uh, uh, connect with the space and the place, uh, what is around you, um, which makes it an, an, a very deep experience, absolutely um, multi-dimensional experience. Of listening. Yeah, and I think that now, um, so when I first decided to start Embark on um, learning about sound, it was with my body. So when I was writing this project proposal, it was actually because of a memory, again, something that I had experienced when I was in my 20s of listening to ice fracture on a lake and settle and I just remember hearing that sound and actually the sound is not too dissimilar to some of these sounds that I'm that I've distorted with these bat sounds um, to the way the sound of the ice moving was um, and 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 that was so impactful for me that I actually wanted to lay down on the ice to listen to with my body with my entire body um, and that was long before I was actually thinking about sound as embodied sound or sense memory sound
Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I really, I really, I really loved hearing it. Um, I've, for my sound walk September, I've been. Um, I wrote a sound poem based on the sounds of birds in a tunnel, or the lack of them. So this really um, is reminiscent of the experience I had, and and because of what Geert was saying, and because I'm a dancer, it made me imagine that. I know that children, when they listen, they don't sit still to listen. They instinctively move. And that's what I, I felt that I want, wanted to do when I was listening just now. Do, do you have a body memory as well as a, an emotional or sound memory um, from when yes. you were a child? Yes, and that, I, I don't know, maybe you came in just a little bit late, but when I first was uh, introducing the piece, that was what got me into this place of like really wanting to um, uh, find these audio recordings of bats was because when I heard the first chirp, it really evoked in me that, that memory on a cellular level of, of being a child and hearing those sounds. Yeah, I heard you say that, but I wondered if you remember any movements that you made. Um, hmm, that's interesting. I can't say that I, I, I remember the movements so much, but, um, but I, I too have a dance background. And so, so moving, moving was, you know, is part of what I do. It's just, yeah, I, I, but I don't actually remember specifically other than protect, maybe I, maybe I was, I was frozen you know, to listen carefully, you know, to stop everything so that I could listen carefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the that incredible range that we heard, both in terms of pitch and um, tone, I could feel myself reaching and, and moving to listen. And it reminded me of Yes, of the you know I could really feel this bouncing off of walls or this this reverberation. So thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And and to go with that, actually the bats looked as though they were dancing overhead. And so I did want to kind of play with that. That's why I added the two extra speakers above. So the initially it was only eight speakers surround, and then and then I I just kept feeling something. There was something missing. So. Um, I found these other two speakers that are directional, and they provided that extra movement above, which really brought in that kind of feeling that these bats were dancing around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any connection between the movements they were making and the sounds they were making? <sighs> Probably not at that time. I can't say I did because I was so fascinated with the fact that I actually got to hear a bat in so many years. That I was just, you know, my my mouth was open and I was just like fascinated. <laughs> but next time I will, I'll I'll be more aware of that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I've got sort of a different question to come into my head now. Is um, the only way that I can uh, relate to what you're saying is is my revelation was in terms of fine art and seeing paintings. And I had no explanation of these paintings, but it's particularly sort of early 20th century art. It spoke to me directly. So there was something that spoke to me. And I would call this spiritual. Now, I've got a sense that, that it's not, with sound, it works in a different way. You pick up on it in a different way. I've just got this sense that it would need or require a sort of a space, like this space that you're creating, but also my body, physical movement within it, that would be the way that I would receive it. It's not like standing in front of a picture as it was for me then and just picking up the spirituality of it. Because it, it was the thing that transformed my life. But I just, I don't know how, uh, it, you know, it's just that, that there's a, a feeling that there's a sort of breakthrough here. Uh, this whole, the, the whole dimension of sound it is it is a much a sort of a, 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 a broadening of, of the visual field into sort of a much bigger arena, a bigger sort of. But as yet, I can't quite connect with it. Do you have any ideas or suggestions on how? I mean, I can be I can be specific. You know, just in this sense, are there any preconceived ideas we have 
that up to now has prevented us from even being aware, for example, of life forms outside ourselves. You mentioned about trees and it's a matter of adjusting uh, to their frequency and finding a way to attune to that in order to get it. And in a sense, it then the, the much bigger, we've never really decoded the language of yet of, 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 of similar species. We've got the things like barks, annoyance, and all that sort of thing, but they're very, you know, obvious sort of things. There might be, well, I'm sure there is a much more subtle communication that we're just mm -hmm. simply not picking up on um, in terms of even animal sounds, but let alone nature's sounds. I mean, up to now, we've only seen trees as things to build houses or to burn for fuel. So this is a, a revelatory understanding, you know, that's come in the 21st century, as far as I know, apart from indigenous people. Now, indigenous people have always had this understanding and this sensibility. For example, aboriginals have the same word, an a, a, an uh, Aboriginal language has the same word for skin and for bark. And this is just um, a, a different way of, uh, 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 so maybe our way in could be through indigenous beliefs and indigenous culture. The, the, some, the, the chief voodoo priest in Haiti said to me, Haiti is waiting for the rest of the world to slow down, to catch up basically. So it's a matter of reattuning re to um, a, a wisdom that surrounds us. But in the same way that we've disregarded trees um, for centuries or the, in the West, um, maybe there's, this is just right on our doorsteps that we, through preconceived ideas, our own preconceived ideas are preventing us from uh, adjusting or, or getting in touch with a very natural thing that we sort of dissociate from childhood onwards. Do you have any sort of reflections in that sort of area? Yeah, I think, I think it's because we've been programmed to use our intellect over our, you know, our, our sort of internal um, so we, we, we function mostly in our head and in our brain and we let that because that's how we've learned. So, so then we kind of forget before that the knowing that we carried in our cells as humans just being here on the planet. Um, and we quickly disregard that and allow the, you know, the brain, the analytical meaning making machine to kind of rule us. And I think as soon as we start to stop thinking with the head and start thinking with the body, we're going to start being able to tune into these, these frequencies um, more easily. And I love that you keep talking about trees because I had an experience last year in the fall uh, walking through the forest um, and I, it was at night, so I had done a night walk and it was in October and it was you know, black. I could not see the stars um, until I got into a clearing. And I knew that there was a stream along the side of this pathway, but I couldn't, I could hear the stream. I couldn't see the stream. And I just trusted my body to find the way where I was going. And at one point I stopped on the path because I thought I heard, um, I thought I heard sort of a moaning sound and um, when the group returned to this clearing, we sort of talked about it and I had asked, had anybody else hear, heard the moaning? And I said, I'm sure I heard a tree moaning. <laughs> and they all thought I was kind of like, you know, losing my mind, but a few other people had said, yeah, I heard the tree moaning as well. And I quickly contacted my father who was a, a, a geographer in his lifetime and I, I asked him, you know, have you ever experienced anything like this and is there is there an explanation for it? And he his explanation was that it's probably the water, um, if there was a stream there, that the water was probably running through the the root system and the soft ground and that it created this sort of moaning sound. And I thought, okay, well that's a good explanation, but it just didn't feel that that was that was it felt something different otherworldly almost but um unexplainable well i can i can get right in there because let's let's move from trees to water because apparently we're 60 percent water and water apparently has a memory 
And so the water in us, when we go swimming in the ocean, there's a release of tension. The water in us is communicating with the water in the ocean. And that's purifying. Mm. It's the cellular thing. I'm, I, I mean, it's, this is so wild that I'm not, <laughs> I find, you know, it's a good thing to say I can't get my mind around it, which is exactly right with what you're saying. We need to let our body t inform our minds, basically, rather than that, continually having our minds informing. It just seems to be such a, a, an explosion in, in, well, I think Kandinsky said that, you know, that we, we've got the spiritual revolution is coming. And he wrote concerning the spiritual Absolutely. art in 1911. And I think yeah. this is an aspect of it. It's very broad. Mm -hmm. And and just just to quickly talk about this, you know, uh, the image of sound. I think the other thing is is that I, you know, I I was coming from an image making background where I was actually creating things either visually, you know, you know drawing, painting, photography, that kind of thing, to to this place where. I realized you don't need to have a visual to actually have an image, and and that's when I when I started to do the sound work, I realized how powerful um, the audio is in making the image happen. So so we create the image without the image just by listening. Wow. Thank you for all of your insights. That was that was great. I have a, another practical question. Uh, you mentioned that you used 27 and then you used a particular word. Now I've forgotten. Maybe uh, I used, uh, yeah, the vocalizations, 27 different vocalizations. Oh, maybe I'm not being heard. Vocalizations. Uh, yeah. Basically, you used 27 different samples. Is that it? That's right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And, and again, um, the, the scientific equipment has the ability of, of showing me, you know, the data and what the species of bats were, um, but I wasn't so much interested in that. Um, I could go back and do that if I wanted to. I was just more interested in, in actually experiencing the sounds of the bats communicating with one another. We are uh, slowly going to the, to a one and a half one hour and a half of um, exchange of visions, ideas, and insights, like you said, uh, Kelly. Um, so, um, if anybody wants to have a, a last question or a last word, uh, please go for it. Or otherwise, we continue our days with uh, the memory, yeah. not the memory of water, but the memory <laughs> about uh, this flowing conversation. Um, uh, um, and then it only uh, leaves me to thank you, Kelly, and everybody who is uh, here and who was here uh, to uh, contribute to this dialogue. Yes, I, I, I would like to say thank you as well for everybody who attended and, and for your uh, the gracious conversations that we had. And uh, I encourage you all to check out what's happening on Soundwalk September. There's so many fantastic events and uh, so much to be learned about and and uh, and contribute with um, or contribute to. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs>